Hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 562, that's 562 of the Agostino Zynga Show, I hope you are good wherever this show may find you. And if you're watching this via YouTube, you would have noticed my hair, the braids are no longer here, I had to take them out because unfortunately my um ape-like hands as joe rogan would say right my chimpanzee looking hands my planet of the ape looking hands um did not allow me to have my braids in for a long time i kept picking them at the side or getting scratched i was getting itchy i was scratching it and then i ended up having little strands like loose and stuff and it, i just looked like a you know like a crackhead basically and i didn't want to look that way because although i'm intrigued by what crack may be like i'm not necessarily going to be a crackhead anytime soon because i'm a bit of a pussy you know what i mean so i was but i did enjoy the fact that i was able to have a somewhat carefree life in terms of my hair i was able to wear regular hats i didn't have to have this mound of hair on top and whatnot so as soon as i get my fade done which i need to get done somewhere separately i'm going to definitely get the top of my hair braided as well so that's going to be done all together or together but yeah i need to get it I need to get redone basically simple as that but the good thing about it um is that now I understand and get why people like to break their braid their hair it really is the best way to keep your hair neat if you've got a long hair like mine especially afro hair and it actually helps to help the hair grow back healthy or healthily whatever that word is um I have noticed since I've taken my hair out the the you know it does look a little bit stronger than it did before obviously i've kind of conditioned it and stuff whatever but it does look far more healthy than what it's ever looked on channel i think if you guys have seen my hair before you would have seen even from this crappy webcam camera you would have seen that it maybe hasn't been looked after the best right it maybe is a suffering <laughs> for the fact that i don't necessarily take care of my hair as much as i should do but hey you know we've all got our we've all got our uh, blind spots you know um lex Friedman's blind spot is vladimir putin my blind spot is my hair it is what it is we all have our blind spots but yeah here we are hopefully get that done and fixed very 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 soon but um yeah man i wanted to jump straight into this because this has been the talk of my side of the internet and something that i kind of have been covering to some relative consistency over the years but i kind of pulled off in the last few months whatnot because it just got boring um there's only so much you know you can there's only so much of that content you can just watch and keep kind of subjecting yourself to um just for the clicks and the views it's not worth it personally for me so that's not what I, what what's not what i started this thing for i didn't start this podcast for views or clicks i started it because i just wanted to have people to talk to because i don't necessarily have any real friends <laughs> do you know what i mean so if i could share some of the stuff that i'm into with a with people online who maybe might view it and also might contribute and also might view and also write whatever that's a good thing but it wasn't necessarily like okay i'm gonna do it for views first so when i did happen to stumble upon the t fat k universe as a fan first of all let's start that from before i started off as a fan i was a big fan of brendan i thought he was really good on joe rogan early the early times i thought especially during the fight companions it was always incredibly funny him and brian Callen had a good rapport you were kind of rooting for him as well because at the time you know it was kind of being made you were kind of realizing in real time that dana white was an absolute scumbag of a guy and to see brendan kind of standing up to him and the ufc when in terms of the reebok deal you just kind of went to back him you kind of went to he kind of had the underdog feel about him about what he was trying to do in terms of you know um trying to push for increasing fighters pay um trying to push for fighters to have their own sponsorship and be able to have their brands on their shorts and all that good stuff blah 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 the reebok deal of course good douche all of that but I did start from being a fan of T-Fat K and then I'm not sure what happened. I can't pinpoint it in terms of the precise moment where I kind of was like, nah, this isn't for me anymore. But it might have coincided with me finding, no, you know what actually happened? I think I found the T-Fat K subreddit, the Fire and the K subreddit, the greatest subreddit in the world. I think I might have found that subreddit just as I was getting a bit disillusioned with the podcast because I think that's what happens. Maybe, yeah, it happens twofold. Either you like her show that much no it doesn't happen too far because i've never i've never went on the wire subreddit i don't care i love the wire it's an amazing show i just move on i think when you're like a bit like when you watch a show and you're like hmm was that crap or am i just or am i uh being over critical 
was that a bit rubbish was that a bit of a letdown you then start to look online and see if people agree with you right and then you find communities people like saying yeah this is terrible that's same thing happened with game of thrones i don't know was it like season five people started to get a little bit like mm, this is a bit this is going a bit weird isn't it I think I had the same thing with the Finding the Kid. And then I stumbled across the subreddit. I actually went on there, I think I'm pretty sure, started defending Brendan. Like, oh, you guys are being too mean. Move on, let him alone. I don't know. I think I started with that. And then as you kept watching the content, you know, slowly but surely, of course, because, you know, it's just, it's all, I've, I've, I've always said, especially when it comes to people that do this stuff online, content creators and influencers, you usually dictate people's reaction to you for the most part you can't control all of it but i think for the most part the overwhelming consensus about you from people that enjoy or content or whatever is usually i think the truth for the most part there are people of course are going to go over the overboard but i think it's usually the truth and it's usually stuff that you've done and of course over time brendan kind of you know basically let his true kind of showing just came up like a bit of a prick and i just stopped listening to it and i'm a kind of person who just stops listening and moves on but then over time, of course, you know, I invested so many of, of my years of my life listening and watching that content. It just started to piss me off when I started to hear C and see certain things. I'd comment on my channel. I'd make some videos about Brenda, make some videos about Brian Kellen, about that whole LA comedian circle group of people. And then over time, I started to get a little bit disillusioned with it. Um, I didn't want to have my channel just to be like, you know, a place where I'm going in and kind of attacking these guys or her, whatever. That's not even what I was getting it for. I'm a fan. Um, when they do something stupid, I'll just comment on it because they're people that I kind of view their content and they're people that you would kind of um, deem to be celebrities in some way, shape or form. So, you know, part of, of living a celebrity life is, you know, if somebody, if you secure a multi-million dollar deal, someone will make a video on that. And if you do something stupid, like drive drunk, you know, uh, get caught driving, um, drink driving, whatever, you'd also get made a video on that too. I, don't, I think it's, you know, they both kind of exist on the same spectrum. It is what it is. But for whatever reason, it appears like Brendan is incredibly thin-skinned and doesn't like it when people make videos about him. So much so that he's going after this um, YouTuber that I'm aware of called, uh, was it Super Saiyans? Is it, it was his original name? Was it Saiyans Entertainment? And then he's got another channel now that he started that's also been taken down called Uniques. And essentially, from what I can gather online, it looks like um, the video that he made on Brendan allegedly cheating on his wife is what has kind of sparked this i don't think so because i think in general this guy saiyan's guy he definitely picked up the slack that i didn't pick up the stuff that he was doing i would never do in terms of reporting on every single little thing that was going on in that world i just don't care enough about those guys like that um i catch what i can catch whenever i can catch it but you know who cares but um i guess in the eyes of someone like a brendan who generally thinks um people who have anything negative to say about him are bottom feeder kind of like less than human um not worth your time neck beard you know cheeto finger people this is this is this sh we shouldn't be surprised right this is this is the opposite of uh, you you'd be surprised we shouldn't be surprised that he would have done this because he, brendan's always had a very um bad impression or negative opinion of people who don't like his content or don't like him as a person which i've never really understood because i've always thought in my head that someone like a brendan he actually would have a lot to gain by kind of leaning into the hate a bit or by maybe making a joke of it a little bit that would actually be something that would actually you know for somebody who cares about money a lot and ticket sales and all that sort of stuff that would actually work in his favor more than this kind of like oh you guys don't matter you're homeless it's like a homeless person commenting on my comedy um you know you don't fuck chicks like all these weird things that he kind of pulls out of his ass in terms of to kind of um make himself feel better about his lackluster career but in general it doesn't matter in general it, it shouldn't really matter right the guy's a multi-millionaire he's got a family he has a wife he drives amazing cars he's got great friends like it shouldn't matter what some random person on the internet says about you and uh, the fact that they don't like your content because clearly some people do clearly some people are willing i don't know why they're willing to pay hard-earned money to come and see you perform on stage and you know do a routine that's probably I don't know that probably has enough jokes in it to kind of fill the flipping toilet or whatever right like terrible 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 stand-up like objectively terrible 
but people don't mind it and if that's the case and again i'm a big believer in letting the market decide it's why i'm not really a big fan of counterculture in that way right because in general counterculture for the most part is like a small select group of people telling you hey you don't have the right to have a career we've decided you don't get a job we decided you have to sit down we decided you get fired no i don't like that i'm a big believer in let the market decide the market decides that what you did was so egregious they're not gonna you know buy your stuff or view your thing cool then you have to die a slow death but you know the industry insiders or gatekeepers don't have to decide that and clearly customers fans of brendan have decided that he's good enough for merch they like him enough to go to see his shows they like him enough to wait view his videos blah 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 so clearly he's got a fan base there so i don't know why this is a thing i really don't know i can't for my life i can't for the life of me kind of figure it out and to make matters even worse now he's got people like the quartering after him right who is kind of like you know somebody that's well known within the pod the youtube space i say podcast space, the youtube space um somebody who i kind of you know had gone off as well in terms of watching his content i think you know watching a million videos about brie larson there's only so much videos about brie larson one man can watch and in general i don't care about you know culture war stuff as much as he, he seems to but one thing that you can't begrudge him is that he does really um go after and kind of have the back of small youtubers when stuff like this happens he's always in their corner and he has a somewhat um autistic level of de attention yeah? autistic level of kind of a dedication to these sort of things so he's going to see this through until the bitter end he's not going to let this one go so the fact that he's kind of um brendan has kind of you know come across uh the quarter in sort of vision or attention is a real bad thing going forward because if anything this is essentially the barbara streisand effect in in all you know in full effect basically this is it this is what we're seeing in real time um in, a, in an effort to kind of conceal hide and do away with any dissenting voices it's only going to bring more eyes to whatever that person was saying about him in the first place and it's going to reveal other things too off the back of that and if you think i'm joking no here's a post courtesy of the fire and the kid um one of these i think was it set designer i guess or something along those kind of lines um said the following on the fire on the quarter in quarter so on the quarter in twitter, twitter that he put up right he replied on him and said um this guy called alex d said oh this guy hired me um to design his podcast studio never paid me for my work and then stole my designs he's a scumbag don't let him get away with this um the top is my concept design for brendan Shaw, which he and his cronies engaged me for they ghosted me and stopped responding to my emails for payments then a few weeks later a buddy sent me this screenshot of his new set ripping off my idea so essentially this guy designs podcast studios he sends a brief or an idea they go through a consultation i'm assuming if you're a designer you know even if you don't decide to go with the idea you have to pay somebody for their time for basically you know uh sitting down and specking out an idea putting together some sheets from some kind of concepts or whatnot this is what you do and you'd imagine this is just standard procedure especially for somebody who took so you know boldly about creators and wanting to pay people for their work and stuff to do this is quite a scummy move and don't get me wrong the set itself isn't the most original idea in the world but still it's fairly close to what the set the guy designed like sketched out as a plan for the final kids fairly close to what they eventually ended up going for and then obviously they ended up changing that because you know brendan good douched um what's his name malik and then you know this whole thing had to change over time but this is what happens you go after one person you try and silence them and then all these other people who have been wronged by you who didn't really feel the need to maybe come out and say nothing or maybe felt that it might be career repercussions if they do come out repercussions eh, if they do come out and say something about you have now got courage now because everyone's attacking you to come out and say hey yeah this guy is a piece of shit yeah this guy is a scumbag like that's what essentially does happen going forward um and i just can't for the life of me figure out why brendan thought this was a good idea this is legitimately one of the dumbest things he's ever done and another thing that's really really incredible to kind of keep in mind here is that off the back of this lawsuit because i think um before the video i would have played the video but unfortunately unique channels got taken down um he mentioned in the lawsuit or no someone pointed out in a lawsuit that the address for thick boy is registered to address someone in colorado so people are maybe um hypothesizing that that might be his dad's house or whatever it may be right but it's funny because one of the other unredeeming um, facts of ish, you know, traits of Brendan, he lies or just embellishes the, the the story or whatever, just unnecessarily, just to make himself look better. But then actually, 
the lies and the kind of arrogance and that pompous attitude and that you can't tell me nothing, all that sort of stuff. It's what people, it's what turns people off of him. And he's never really kind of realized that. And I don't understand it. And it's like, this one's a good example. It's like, most likely from what I can surmise, the uh, registering a business in another state is maybe a, a kind of a tax thing, right? You maybe want to get, or you maybe don't want to pay as much tax. So it's kind of a clever thing to maybe register your company in a state that isn't whatever, okay? But in another sense, this also could, also could be evidence that most likely his dad's an investor in the company that he's got now, Thick Boy Studios. And the whole narrative that he was kind of trying to paint was that he was this scrappy guy who decided to leave Showtime off his own volition, which obviously wasn't true, or what I don't think it's true. And he decided to then put his own money into starting his own network um, and kind of, you know, taking ownership of his own career instead of going to the big networks and stuff in order to kind of boost him. No one believed that because no one believed that he would willingly walk away from a pretty decent salary at showtime and a pretty easy job where he didn't do any research or homework on any of the fights or the cards or anything going on on that week that he was commentating on he just reacted to kind of news that you know chin basically gathered up that morning no one knew, no one believed that he just would willingly walk away from that so the fact that he would embellish a story anyway doesn't make any sense because the actual truth isn't that bad either like i got fired so what everyone gets fired my dad's helping me out and invested some money in it cool that's what you should be doing if your dad's got some cash and he's you know it's and he and he doesn't mind helping his son that is an actual blessing to be able to have that in your life to be able to have somebody that can support you that shouldn't be something that you hide or you embellish or you try and make it seem like you're just kind of you know upstart guy plucky um you're on your own if you're against a man you clearly got help and it's okay to have help but it's this whole thing he does the same thing with joe rogan everyone everyone would say for the most part would say yes this guy would never have had the career he's had now without the joe rogan cosign we can all say that let's be completely honest especially the level that he's at now but we can't say he can he would never have a career no for sure he definitely made the most out of his relationship with Brent, with joe rogan cool but let's also tell the truth and say without this relationship with joe rogan you wouldn't be the person that you are now at the level that you're at now no way shape if just just in terms of followers we can all say for sure for followers if he wasn't a joe rogan one of joe rogan's kind of highest reoccurring guests he wouldn't have as many followers as he does on social media even the social media followers aren't even legit but imagine he wouldn't have as many as he does at the moment but then even that he lies about so it's just a constant circle and barrage of lies and embellishment that i've never really understood but i guess it's just one of those things that when you're that person um when you're that kind of like a what do you call it when you're that um when you're that guy it's just you can't help it and um yeah i, I don't know man um i what you call it i hope he's able to kind of get his channel back uniques um hope he's able to come back and do his thing um i think it's horrible uh, i think this kind of bullying and silencing of creators is despicable really um so much so now this guy re a really cool article about it actually detailing the whole affair here that i'll quickly read out but courtesy of a website called calfkicker.com it says counterculture hater brendan Shaw is suing a small youtuber this and they you know, used one of the worst photos of brendan as well they're looking inflamed full of grease and sugar and whatever else and whiskey and um, it's continued to say brennan shop has the most interesting career trajectory notwithstanding his meteoric meteoric rise in popularity and exposure in the last few years shop star has fallen drastically in recent months once the host of two showtime podcasts he is now struggling to make ends meet on his newly founded thick boy on his YouTube house network, Shaw currently features podcasts from various supporting characters in the T5K universe. His original podcast, in addition to hosting a reboot of Joe Rogan's Fight Companion called Calabasas Fight Companion. Joe Rogan is not involved. The only redeeming factor of his network, in terms of the numbers, is the said fight companion and this is mostly due to shop's heavy reliance on cancelled comedian chris D'Elia to prop up his numbers prior to getting cancelled over his snapchat and dms to various minors <laughs> D'Elia has a beginning acting career addition to his own youtube channel of 518k um the chris D'Elia thing man is incredible because that guy is legitimately like holding up that entire network like let's no make no bones about it like because he's actual box office like podcast box office like wherever he goes numbers go like he still still even off the back of all of that um controversy and stuff and you know crazy allegations and whatnot he's still able to pull 100k views like on average on these podcasts like crazy right which is pretty which is saying something and when he goes on t5k he has such good rapport with brian callum you know especially all those um 
10 minute podcast fans come out in droves as well to watch them have their thing brendan awkwardly tries to you know clutch his way in there so you really do wonder what would happen for TV, for the fire and the kid um or sorry for the thick boy what you call it network if chris Lear wasn't associated with it and now obviously they brought him into the king of the sting as well it was quite a smart move by Brenda, to be fair. That bringing in Chris Lee, we have to give him props on that one. Like bringing in Chris Lee was one of the smartest things he's ever done there. It continues to say, but the community of those who do not like Shaw but just keeps growing a subreddit dedicated to his oldest venture. The podcast of Fire and the Kid has more than doubled in its size since June 2020. Filled with MMA fans and those interested in podcasts, it's most dedicated to posting various gaffes of Shaw's day in and day out podcasting. Without the patronage of Joe Rogan, Shaw is often forced to reinvent the wheel in order to gin up interest in his brand. However, pivoting from one controversial take to another, can lead to unintended if not sometimes comical results in the last latest attempt of contradictory petitions in spite of heaping praise on spotify anti-work ceo last month Shaw was reportedly attempted to censor a small channel dedicated to reacting to his own content great point this guy made yeah because he sure went on his flipping joe rogan you know sucker for fun which again i make makes sense because the guy legitimately gave him a career he took away one career and gave him another career right he took away his ufc career but he gave him a, this podcasting career so i understand sucking him off but he was going you know so happy on the whole like oh daniel Eck for being against the work culture and being uncancelable and most nonsense but then he wants to then cancel somebody or silence them because he doesn't like what they have to say it's just like pick a lane Papa. It continues. Recently, a creator named um, Un uh, Unique Nix, Uniqueness lost his main channel, Uniqueness, thanks to the copyright strikes he received from Shaw, and he is now being sued. During a three minute video on his new channel, the creator shares some bits of the lawsuit through the Thick Boy Productions Creator Inc., reportedly being sued for copyright infringement. The channel Unix has reportedly been struck from the posting of video of Shaw's exchanging a phone number with a young lady. While his infraction is nothing compared to the trouble the comedians um, buddies get into, um, exactly, Christian and Brian Cannon. Shaw is currently married and has two kids this explains a lot though and this explains a lot of them because do you remember there was a time when um what's his face remember when i told yeah remember i think i mentioned on the podcast there was a time when flipping brian callant was going to sue the husband of the person that accused him of the r word right and the premise of it was all uh, because the husband was going on the tear calling up all the places that brian callum was meant to be performing at and getting his shows cancelled for him right and he was like no you're taking business you're taking food out of my kid's mouth you're not you're preventing me from making an income blah, blah 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 there's some you know you could say there he's got maybe some room there in terms of yeah you just can't go around like you know basically trying to destroy my career in that direct of, of, of a way if it happens indirectly as a consequence of people reporting on my case so be it but you just calling up people directly and harassing them is just not on fair cool but in terms of optics that is a crazy move to make insane move and also shows a real lack of self-awareness and a real lack of humility understanding even now forgive the, the brand kind of thing let's say he didn't think he did it right he definitely doesn't think he did it he definitely doesn't think he did the r word or he you know um essayed these ladies cool but four of them came out and shared their stories right and you never once heard him speak with any kind of compassion um regarding them regarding issues surrounding consent any anything it was all just like completely made up no this is false nothing and just completely moved on like nothing happened of course a lot of things happen after that you know you kind of you know separate from no that separation from his um ex-wife thing happened maybe before that but still it's been a whirlwind of things for him in it separation um cancellation then hooking up with this new person that he's with now at the moment having a child when he's like 55 like mad anyway whatever cool do you no judgment on that regards not my business but it kind of makes sense in it if one person can sue the husband of the r word accuser because he feels like that person is impacting his ability to make money when actually maybe you allegedly r wording people is impacting your ability to make money more so it's not too far away from somebody like a brendan deciding to sue a small youtuber because they decided to highlight a video, a live stream, right? Again, Brendan Shaw is most, it must be the most unlucky doof that exists in the world, isn't it? He's the only person that could go on a live stream, you know, um, with Tyson, Brandon Marshall, and I forgot who the other person, oh, um, Daniel Cormier, right? And get completely shown up, right? Everyone kind of was basically laughing at him on a live stream. Couldn't really hang with the guys, which is, again, ironic, and he tries to go on about how alpha he is and how big dog he is, but when he's actually around 
actual alphas, right? Actual people who don't need anything from him. He doesn't know how to hang. He doesn't necessarily know how to vibe. He's not necessarily cool or anything. So he kind of was a bit off in that regard. Fine, no problem. And of course, there's some, you know, weird energy between him and Tyson because of all the stuff he said about Tyson in the past. And then suddenly he comes on Food Truck Diaries and he starts gargling his nuts. I'm sure Tyson's been made aware after the fact of what Brendan Shields said about him beforehand. Um, but then he's the most unlucky person because I don't know why that happened, but I guess because it was filmed in some really swanky uh, um, mansion somewhere in the Hollywood Hills, they were doing these like shots that like showed the whole house. Cause I guess that's what they're, they're doing the live stream of when they're watching the Super Bowl. Um, that's where, that's why I mentioned this whole like Brian Cannon, Brendan Shulman, Mike Tyson things happening. And they had this shot where they were kind of showing you the entirety of the, of the place where the live stream was happening. And for whatever reason, at that very moment, they were showing that clip or that shot um, Brendan um, walks up to he's walking and kind of doing his whole like weird kind of I don't know seduction walk um, towards a group of people sitting down and there's a girl there and he taps one of the ladies on there who doesn't necessarily look very voluptuous or anything which is just the interesting part because you, you're like oh why does this happen her for because she looks quite small because he's always talking about girls with massive bums and obviously his girl's got a really you know um, huge derriere so that's the first one that caught me off guard. So I was like, oh, okay, fair enough. I guess he's he's into all types. And then they have a little conversation and he slips or something, a number or something, who knows, a bit of paper, and he walks off. But it's all, it all gets caught on camera. And then he does this weird that kind of look back thing, trying to be, I don't know what happens there, but it's all caught on camera, right? So it's, it's it obviously looks bad. Um, we don't know what happened. It's not our business. Who, who really cares? But it's something to laugh about, legitimately something to laugh about. Or if you're smart and it is something really... Um, problematic you don't talk about it at all and you hope it goes away so that your actual girl doesn't see it right and that people just move on that's what you hope is going to happen you do what Joe Rogan does and pretend it doesn't it didn't happen and just continue motoring on but for whatever reason he decided again this is such the wrong time to do it. he said off the back of that to go and go and do the lawsuit which then if you think about it, moments prior to that this whole Annie Liederman thing happened right on her show where she was like talking about how all um you know, alleged, allegedly, you know, the whole like walk me to my truck thing happened. I just can't, I just for the life of me can't understand how this guy, like, I can't for the life of me understand this guy's um decision making process. I'm just like, like, how, why do you decide to do these things in succession? Like, why would you do this? Why, why would you do this? Or maybe he's true. Maybe he does not because he always says this all the time that he doesn't, um, that he doesn't think imagery, he doesn't read comments, right? Maybe it's true. He doesn't read comments. Maybe, maybe it's true. He doesn't read comments and he clearly doesn't know what's going on out there, but the perception of him hasn't been the best. But yeah, I won't read the entire article because, you know, I've already been rambling already for a minute here about this whole thing. But yeah, I hope Eunice gets his channel back. Totally disgusting move from Brendan. Again, not surprised. Um, I'm not surprised personally. I think maybe some of you guys might be, but I'm definitely not surprised that he would have done something like this. I think this is always on the cards for someone like a Brendan Shaw, but um, he's impervious to criticism um, somebody who clearly doesn't really understand or get why people hate him. Um, he clearly thinks he's the smartest person in the room all the time when he clearly is the dumbest. Um, and in general, has been the one sole reason why I stopped listening to the podcast. Obviously, Brian Callan's a close second. He starts to get really annoying towards the end, but he's bearable because he's funny. But, you know, that's basically what happens. Like, you, you be annoying if you want to, but just be funny. And these guys weren't funny. They took themselves too seriously. The whole COVID thing as well was horrible to us from afar. The way they were kind of, um, you know, conducting themselves during the height of COVID was just embarrassing to say the least. Um, but yeah, he's the main reason why people turned up on the show. Brendan is the main reason why most people are detractors or why most people are haters, as he likes to say. Honestly, it's the main reason why. And he hasn't, for whatever reason, come to grips with it. It's something that he still kind of, not say denies, but it just doesn't, it's for whatever reason he can't necessarily just figure out why people hate him change the things about him that people hate or just i don't know double down and i don't know do something do something i don't know i don't know i don't know i, don't know. I really don't know about this guy honestly i'm sure oh, is it my thing froze hopefully it didn't freeze did it freeze oh no it's frozen did it freeze Did it freeze? Oh no, it didn't freeze. Cool. I thought it freeze. For whatever reason, this is not working now. I'm okay, cool. I need to take this off as well. Bear with me. Bear with me. My computer's loading now for whatever reason. 
just doing the madness. I've got the wheel of death. To be fair, this is actually the one time where I have actually too many windows open. Like legit too many windows. I've definitely got to close some. I don't know which ones to close because some of them have got some interesting stuff on it that I don't want to get rid of, man. It's not working now. The two oh man, I hate when the, the little swisher thing that I got doesn't work sometimes and it? it can be really annoying. But anyway, let's move on from that one. Um bear with me one second whilst I get all these things off of the window so hopefully I don't get the wheels of death anymore. Rainbow wheel of death, I think. Let's just move on again here. Come on, I've got those cool. There you go, cool. Let's start this one. All right, cool. Next one to talk about here quickly. I went to quickly mention this because I just saw this on my feed. Or oh, is this my, is this still coding overloading? Is it still overloading? Is it still being weird? Come on, encoding overload, man. This is not going to go well. For whatever reason, the software that I'm using is kind of, okay, now it's back to some sort of semblance of normality, right? Cool. Okay, let's go. So let's quickly move on to this topic. I want to mention here, hopefully this works. Oh my days. Hopefully this works. So yeah, second thing I wanted to mention was, regarding Mr. Eric Griffin and um, his involvement in King of the Stink. Now, most of my podcast fans won't care about this, so I'm going to try and tie this into a larger point about knowing your position because um, it looks like uh, Eric Griffin's been kicked off or replaced or told to sit this one out when it comes to um, King of the Sting. And I think it speaks to a larger point that I want to make about knowing how to play your position, knowing where you stand in the kind of hierarchy of your peer group, of your industry, of whatever thing you're in, is, in my opinion, somewhat of a superpower. And the quicker, especially as a dude, the quicker you realize where you are in a pecking order, the kind of easier your life will be because you'll stop lasting and wanting for things that are not really within your reach and you'll try to make the best of the things that you have available in your reach or you'll maybe honor the things that you have whatever it may be and I think at this moment from what I can see with Eric Griffin again this is from someone that doesn't know the guy I don't really consume much of his content um, I've seen him here and there on other shows that I thought he's quite funny on he does come across like a bit of a whiny baby at sometimes but you know he's a comedian i guess they're all kind of sensitive whiny babies to some extent but um he seems pretty funny he seems like a pretty chill dude and from the times that i've seen him on king of the sting he seems to be quite funny and a good addition to the show because he seems like he seems like one of the only ones on there that kind of sounds like a grown-up right when they're talking about serious issues now again you're not going to go on king of the sting for serious issues the whole the whole premise of king of the sting when it first started was you know it was kind of off the back of um when Theo first kind of got involved with Brendan Shaw and Brian Cannon, he would kind of, you know, rip them, right? Especially Brendan, he ripped them, right? Like, oh, they would go back and forth in terms of insulting each other. And it was really funny, really, really good stuff. Because especially for fans that didn't like Brendan, he was the one person that legitimately we kind of felt like was roasting him in a joking way, but also in a serious way. And people kind of got to live vicariously through some of the insults that Theo would levy towards Brendan. So that was cool. So it's kind of like a like a roasting session thing and over time i guess it evolved into whatever it is now um you know brendan has jokes written for him and they have the segments in like a tv show product it's whatever not whatever it's just a youtube show and it? it's just a podcast youtube thing that same similar to what i do and they riff in between because they're comedians now for whatever reason um theo has been in and out of the show there's personal reasons you know it's going to be mentioning his depression and stuff, but I, I, I don't know. For me personally, I just think he's kind of in a bit of a moment where he probably doesn't want to do it anyway. But, you know, as per most things, because they started it together and maybe because he doesn't like confrontation, he probably hasn't got the courage enough in him to kind of say, hey, I don't want to do this anymore. Or maybe just because the money's good. I don't feel like depression thing is a thing. I just think he just doesn't want to do it because he's probably maybe worn out. He's got other things going on. Who knows? But he hasn't been on a lot of the shows and they went in to get new guests in. And I guess they decided to, reach out to Eric and so far he's been doing okay on the show and for every reason in no and for every reason and then all of a sudden 
Chris Alia comes back into the fold. He pops out, out. He kind of leaves his house looking a bit weathered and haggard, but still able to pull numbers, right? This guy is still like consistently getting, you know, within the kind of 80, sorry, within the kind of 80 to 100,000 views, uh, you know, on his, on his podcast legitimately. So, you know, the babies are still there um, supporting the guy, even though he was accused of what he was accused of, right? Being a diddler. So, but then when Chris came back into the podcast and fold, like him or not, not what like what he did allegedly or was accused of doing or not, the guy's blockbuster. The guy's podcast blockbuster or blockbuster, as um fucking Shaw would say. Like he brings the numbers, he's funny as hell, and he actually makes the show more enjoyable. Wherever he's on, he kind of adds to it because of how silly and fun he is and whatnot. Blah blah blah. Obviously, it can be a little bit much because it can all be about him, him, him. But if you really want to kind of have a successful show especially on youtube and shit and you get delir involved it's going to go to the moon so um all that to say it looks like a shiny new toy came along or shiny old new toy came along um they saw the numbers they saw the reception for the fans it worked better probably because they're, they're probably more friends i'd guess right I, 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 it'd be fair to assume Brendan, Theo and Chris probably know each other better than um, Eric does know each of them individually or together, I'd imagine so. So it just works as a show better that way. And in general, um, in my opinion, in my opinion, I just don't think Eric is at that level those guys are. And I think it's a mindfuck for him because he would clearly think in his head he's probably funnier than both of Theo and Brendan on the stage. Maybe he might um might acquiesce and say, you know, Delia might be funny to him on stage or maybe someone's hard to follow. But for sure in his head he would definitely think, yeah, I could I'm definitely a better comic than Brendan because anybody is. And he definitely thinks he could give Theo a good run for his money. So in his head he thinks he's at that level, but he's not. And I think in general, in life, I've noticed, especially myself in my career, um, I've had a lot of issues with kind of understanding my position in relation with other people and where their careers are, where my career is, the things I've not done, the things I have done. And it can be difficult to kind of wrangle in your head to kind of make it work in your head, especially when you've got people like a Brendan Shaw, because he kind of, that would be the one that would kind of like, it, did, it wouldn't make sense in your head because in your head you'd be like, hold on, this guy's not funny. He can't speak. He's dumb as fuck. Why is he... I mean, it wouldn't make any sense, but life isn't fair. Life isn't, even sport isn't like that. There is no such thing as like a meritocracy. It doesn't really exist. Like you get given opportunities sometimes just through pure luck or through pure connection. It's not always based on your talent or your skill, or whatever. It can just be that or a combination of things. So it can mess up with your head a little bit because you, like, you could look at it analytically, critically and be like, hold on, I'm better at him in every department of this thing. Yet he's got double the bank account that I have or triple, whatever it may be. Um, and unfortunately, that is just how life is. And I think the sooner you um, accept that reality, the better life can be the more kind of at peace you'll be with the position you have because the truth of the matter is Eric Griffin is still super successful he still gets to do what he wants um what he loves when he wants you know uh, you know in for the comfort of his own home he's got a wife I think he's recently right I think he got engaged or something right he's probably gonna have a child soon um you know young you know, like whatever like you, you you're living a sick life like legitimately a sick life you live in LA like you can't be it and you've got your basically your career in your own hands. Great. Uh, for once in your career, you're not you're beholden by the industry or by agents or by whatever. You can do things on your own and kind of smash it that way. Cool. Yes, it's a bit annoying that you're going to get thrown to the side when a newer, shinier toy comes along that people like. But that is unfortunately life. It really is unfortunately life. It's a sad, harsh reality of life. Like sometimes you are the best option available at the time that you're there. But then as soon as somebody else comes along who's better than you in every sense of the word, they are going to replace you with that person. It's going to happen. Like I know even for myself, like I know there's been jobs I've got in the past where clearly I wasn't the best candidate, but I was the best out of a bad bunch. Like that was it. Like I was lucky. That does happen sometimes. You get lucky. You, uh, I wouldn't even say you get lucky. You kind of make your own luck because your momentum. You're going for it, right? Because as much as I, you know, don't think Brendan's funny. Like there's no, there's no doubting. He did really squeeze the the juice out of that lemon or orange, whatever that he got from Rogan. Right? He really made the most of it. Like he really, you know, consistency in the podcasting, the merch, the live shows. Like he really 
made the most out of that shine that that light he was given of being on that podcast which is what allowed him to be the beast that he is now at the moment but yeah of course he's not as funny as eric griffin but this is just the nature of life unfortunately and it happens in every walk of life it really really does and the sooner you accept your position you understand where you are um your life just becomes far easier i think in my opinion um obviously you're, you're allowed to have delusions of grandeur and you're allowed you're allowed to want more you're allowed to maybe you know want to aspire to be at that level but there's also and you have to have some sort of level of acceptance of the level that you're at and this is the level that he's at. He's at that level. His level is this level, doing his own show, um, maybe guesting a couple of times here and there, but it's not being with those guys because clearly they said, you're not part of the cool club. You are over there. Like it's me, it's the Brendan, Theo and Chris. They're the cool guys. They're the kind of box office podcaster guy type people. And you're over there, which is harsh, but it's fair. Not harsh, not fair. It's just, it's life. It's not harsh. It's not fair. It's life it really is that's all it is and i think we can all learn a lesson from that in my opinion um i'll just close out with him talking about it because i don't know why i did this this way i rambled about it my own point um explained what he said without actually playing what he said but yeah this is what eric griffin said about the um him not being on king of the sting anymore play here Low son of it. oh the world went crazy y'all covid hit um our business went 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 away basically in terms of like touring comedian stuff so some people decided to move you know joe rogan moved to austin theo decided to move to tennessee he moved to tennessee and he he still lives there so you know and it's widely known he talks about it they talk about it on their podcast on his own podcast you know he got his own personal issues that he was dealing with and he was dealing with these things the whole time so they still wanted to do their podcast. So they asked Steve to come on the podcast. And then I. They is Brendan, not they. I did it a couple times. And then they approached me like, yo, man, we like this, what you're bringing to the podcast. Can you just come? <clears throat> it, it was no like set like, hey, come this amount of times or that amount of times. It was like, hey, can you come and like be a host with us when. Theo's not there, and then he'll be like Zoom sometimes. Maybe he will be there. And we just started doing it like that. And it just happened like that. So then I'm there. I'm 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 you as you know, I'm there hosting. Sometimes I'm sitting in one seat, sometimes on the couch. You know, they trying to figure that out. It's Theo's show. He could do whatever he wants. He didn't want to sit in that seat. He wanted, he was like, I kind of like this energy. So, you know, and he's was dealing with whatever he was dealing with. So he was in and out, in and out. And so we went for months doing it like that. So then they invited Chris to come on the show uh, with us. Uh oh. And then the whole dynamic changed because it was like, you know, you talking about Chris is a big, huge personality. So is Theo. So is Brendan. So am I, really? So that they, they, so they uh, that dynamic changed, and the numbers were like huge. So they saw something. They were like, "Wow, this is really, uh, really popular amongst the the fans. Negative or positive." It got a lot of views. It got a lot of attention. So they decided that they wanted to try a new format. King, Sting, and the Wing. That's not King, Sting, and Eric. It was never King and the Sting and Eric. It was King and the Sting. And then they, now they decided, hey, let's do King, Sting, and the Wing. And also, let's put it on Patreon. That's where it's a blow in it. Because <clears throat> if you listen to what you said, they never wanted to change the name of the show when he joined. When Eric Griffin joined, it was still King of the Sting, and he was just another guest on like the panel. But then when Chris Alia comes on, it does so well that they are now they're like, oh, we have to change the name of the show now. Well, not we, I guess Brendan for the most part. It seems like was the one driving that boat because he's probably the one looking at the numbers and the views and stuff. Um, and now it's changed. So unfortunately, the fact of the matter is clearly those guys don't necessarily see griffin at the same level that he thinks he sees himself that he, he thinks he sees himself in comparison to them the other thing that's a bit sad about this again for his case in point is the fact that he seems to be the guy that always kind of gets ditched for the most part for whatever reason he's one of the only guys in that comedy la comedy scene who's friends with all those guys but also has never been on rogan which is weird isn't it because you'd think 
he's I, I, is he past the comments i don't know if he is but he's definitely a, a mainstay in that group everyone knows him in that group but then he's never been on rogan i never really understood that maybe rogan doesn't like him i'm not too sure that's a weird one for me in that regard and then the other thing is if i'm not mistaken um good um bad friend law um the podcast with bobby lee and andrew santino was that a supposedly i'm not sure if that's true or that's just like a thing that eric approached bobby to do a podcast first and he didn't want to do it and then I think quite soon after that, um, Andrew Santino and Bobby launched Good Friends or Bad Friends, sorry, right? Uh, Good Friends was the one that Andrew Santino was going to sue them for, right? But yeah, no Bad Friends. So clearly, every time, every time there's a better option out there, people always go for the better option as opposed to hitching their wagon to Eric Griffin. It could be because they don't think he's got enough clout. It could be because they don't think he's funny, or it could just be because of his personality. I don't know. Who knows what the thing is, but. It's just, you know, it's a bit of a, that, that's the only sad thing about it in that regard. Like he's being ditched again. And now he's, you know, massive amounts of copium in terms of trying to explain it, like to make it seem, make it, to make it seem less than a rejection than what it is. But unfortunately, I think for myself, accepting a rejection as personal is actually a better way to move on as just kind of, trying to disassociate yourself from it and trying to explain it away it's actually better to be like no this is a rejection this is the person saying they don't want me then you're able to just say okay they don't want me that's fine hopefully somebody else wants me instead of being like oh no it's like you're going to i always say job interviews because that's the only thing that i know right but it's like going to job interview and not getting a job and then saying oh yeah um i didn't get a good vibe from him anyway yeah they were looking for something it's like no 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 you you, you did the perfect interview you arrived on time you answered every question as best as you could you know da, 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 you, you held their attention you, you know what well, you did a good job but they decided after careful consideration that they didn't want you so basically your best at that time wasn't enough that's okay next day that's actually okay that's actually okay but for whatever reason humans i don't know why we do this to ourselves we kind of try to um you know explain and no but really here's what happened and yeah you know the wing the king i was never on for this i was doing this like no you thought you were part of the gang you thought you were part of the show you were probably waiting to be made official you were probably wondering why they didn't change the name like you were wondering these things and then, you know i guess over time maybe he got a bit disillusioned with the show himself anyway and then decided to change because it was only recently that we i saw that clip of him kind of jokingly not jokingly mentioning to brandon why they didn't get any bonuses what do you think? Do you think? Do you honestly think um, they're not going to get any bonuses? The king winging the sting if they do the numbers they're meant to be doing beyond Patreon. Do you think they're not going to get any flipping bonuses if they do that way? Come on, come on, man. But anyway, let's move off on that one because you know whatever. And uh, grown men decide to do grown men things. It is what it is. Not my business. Let's move on. Let's move on. Uh, I, was, I hate this switch. It doesn't work anymore now, man. It's so annoying, isn't it? oh god i wonder why it does that if someone could tell me in the comments why that happens why why does it happen then sometimes for whatever reason the hot keys just stop working when you're using obs if someone could tell me that i'll be greatly appreciative i really would be man one time you just use it and hot keys work and the next time it just stops working by itself for no apparent reason i don't know why it does that it's so annoying and i have to kind of manually switch it myself it's like oh my life is a misery my life is a misery what have we got here to move on there oh yeah let's talk about this quickly um this is courtesy of oh, why is it why is it tapping this for cool move go away this is courtesy of one second if i can get it up on here yeah this is news courtesy of input mag it says nike is changing how sneakers app works for picking shoes in store um so most of you know the nike app is honestly one of the most infuriating apps of all time it's obviously for me a manifestation and representation of everything that's wrong with sneaker culture and it clearly just shows that for the most part nike doesn't care about the people that buy their shoes they don't care about getting the shoes in actual customers hands they don't care about supplying or fulfilling need and they're just essentially using the shoes as a proxy way of marketing the brand right People say, oh, Nike doesn't need your marketing. Yes, they do. They constantly put out hype products. They constantly put out these limited edition shoes, align themselves with cool people. It keeps them in a the conversation. It keeps their name relevant, despite them having really zero innovation when it comes to, um, you know, casual, you know, fashion-y type sneakers. Everything is retro, retro, retro. And if you're able to kind of, 
generate clicks, views and attention and engagement off of the back of rabid sneakerheads or just hungry to buy anything that you put out. It's going to be a great way to keep yourself in the news, in my opinion. Now, they've supposedly made some changes to the sneakers app. I think if I'm not mistaken, this is in lieu to all the controversy that happened during the pandemic. Do you remember when it was kind of um, uncovered that this kid who was a really big reseller um, happened to be also the son of a really prominent Nike executive. And for whatever dumb, dumb reason, this kid was using his mom's crowd to go and buy shoes in stores and these places and resold them for crazy markups. And, you know, we know this, we, knew, we knew this was happening anyway, but that story, I think kind of exposed how corrupt and broken the sneaker reselling in or sneaker the sneaker industry is in general it kind of just exposed it for what it is of a sham that it is and i think that then shone a light on a sneakers app and how that system is completely flawed and then i think from then on nike if i'm not mistaken made some promises that they were going to fix this fix that blah 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 and i guess this change is part of it so we're going to read it in real time and we're going to see what these and we're going to learn about what these changes actually are and i'm going to give my opinion on whether or not i think these changes will actually do anything in terms of getting people like myself who just want to buy like you know i've I've been a lifelong sneakerhead obviously I, I don't align or rep i don't kind of prescribe all the bullshit you see sneakerheads do online at the moment but unfortunately i've spent you know the best part of two decades buying trainers um limited edition ones so i can't kind of run away from who i am and at the point in my life now at the moment i don't want a queue I don't want to have 17 phones open trying to buy stuff. I don't want to buy a bot. I don't want to do all that stuff. I've got disposable income. I have some time and I want to be able to buy the shoes. And now that the sneaker industry or the sneaker you know, market, whatever it is, is a billion dollar industry. Everyone and their mum knows about Hypebeast, knows about reselling, knows about StockX. This stuff is no secret anymore. It's not some a cool underground thing that I was a part of. It's now a mainstream thing. Cool, no problem. If you're going to be mainstream, then give me mainstream access allow me to buy them why is it still why is it harder to buy shoes now than it was when i was buying like why is it harder to attain or buy why is it harder to attain the shoes that i want limited edition than it was when i first started buying the sneakers when i was buying them when you could only buy them from five retailers and two of them one and two of them one even in the country like why is that of course a corrupt system so let's check and see what nike have done in terms of changing the sneakers up so this is the following. After Nike's limited, no, after Nike limited its sneaker drops through lottery-based draws, the closest sneakerheads had to real-life releases experiences was the Sneakers Pass, which allowed people to reserve shoes on Nike app at a first-come, first-served basis. But with an influx of resellers and bots attempted to, to deceit the app for its own benefit, Nike has announced it will be limiting the feature just as it did with the release. Sneaker Pass will now utilize the same lottery-based draw method seen in sneaker launches. Um, Nike announced through its app users will have to request a sneakers pass reservation during an extended window of time similar to before but once the window closes winners will be chosen at random this what does random mean though again this evolution of sneakers integrates bot filtration tools the same technology used to during an in-app launch to help the real members secure players um, the further protects the integrity and fairness and authenticity of the experience nike run sneakers app the way to respect to <sighs> in this economy um in past years nike buying uh, sneaker leases the, the, the what it says here <sighs> What is this done? What's this going to do? This is going to be no change, no? It's the same thing, but with different wording. Am I, or, or, am I, or am I dumb here? This is the same thing with different wording, no? Anyway, let's continue the article. It says, in the past few years, buying sneakers has become harder than ever. An internal sneaker study last October found that the demand for releases rose by 70% as compared to the year prior, with Nike only able to satisfy 7% of desired sales. So people want to buy your stuff. You're unwilling to just make, again, my premise always comes back to just make more. I refuse, honestly, two decades worth of sneaker experience. I've been to all the flipping, you know, hype releases and whatever, queuing, camping. I've paid my dues. I've done my 10,000 hours. I don't care. My premise or my interpretation of it has always been, if this is a multi-billion dollar industry, if this is now mainstream, why you don't you just make more why can i buy a brand new iphone when it releases even though it's limited by you know maybe not on the initial especially the, the the let's say the first iphone that came out 
it was sold out for a number of weeks because it was hyped and it was a new thing and oh my god crazy it's got a phone a camera and a music player all in one cool but then once it was back in stock i could then buy it but for whatever reason these sneakers even though everyone wants to purchase them there's more demand than there is supply they refuse to resupply them but then they keep inventing these new avenues supposedly to buy shoes it's like no the problem isn't your places to go buy them the problem is the quantity the problem is getting them in the stores the problem is allowing people to have the opportunity to buy them that's the issue the issue isn't oh let's change it from okay to enter isn't to retweet to enter now is to like it's like no that's not the issue the issue is make more shoes but then they don't want to make more shoes because they want to pretend like these shoes are limited edition when they're clearly not limited edition because it's in the, if they were limited edition why does a rep industry exist why do reps exist do people legitimately think reps are people grabbing um you know sample size shoes and then re reverse engineering them and making more come on use your brain that is obviously not how it's happening there i don't need to explain it to you because i don't want to get sued or anything but if you legitimately think people are buying sample pairs and re-engineering them and making reps you are you know what i mean you're naive to the core there's clearly a conflict of interest there. There's clearly more shoes out there than they would like you to believe. So if that's the case, just make more of them legitimately. Make more of them in your factual factories. And that would actually legitimately take away the entirety of the rep industry for the, for the most part. Because from what I read online, similar to myself and my views on reps, I've always said, if I can't get the shoe on on release day, I'm just going to buy the rep. I don't give a shit. I've already, I've already paid my dues. And I think most people get drawn to reps for that for that factor especially the ones who actually want to wear good quality reps the ones who aren't trying to buy the 30 pound kind of aliexpress stuff like legitimately for the most part you're still paying retail it's not like when you buy travis scott dunks or travis scott air forces on flipping a rep site especially a good pair it's not like you're gonna pay like 10 pounds or something you're still gonna pay retail for them for the most part it's still gonna take you know, two weeks to come here or whatnot it's not like a, it's gonna come in a week or whatnot so it's just a re it's, if, if anything it's a reaction to nike not willing to kind of satisfy the demand i've never understood why like the illusion and the myth around rare sneakers is gone it's not what it was before there's no need to keep this facade going it's not it's not an underground culture anymore it really isn't i would like it to be still of course selfishly but it's not like everyone and their mum knows about what rare sneakers are they you know resellers are all over the place like kids you know that are 10 and 12 and are becoming multi-millionaires by selling shoes online it's gone i mean it's it's mainstream that's fine that's cool and if it is mainstream make more and get them in people's hands that's my opinion just make more shoes i don't understand this nonsense that they keep peddling out there as if like we should believe um that it is limited like, it's just <laughs> And this thing, and then maybe this is sneakers. This is not sneakers. This is sneakers pass. I don't know if it's a different app, but this is just a bullshit move. Um, it says here the brand's update um, does alleviate some worry about resellers and bots, but it still adds to the increasing frustration within the sneaker industry. Already, sneakers users have gotten into a habit of checking the app as well as sneaker-centric spaces to prepare for upcoming sneaker passes, but knowing when they drop or even ahead of time won't do you any good. But the passes results are randomized. What does randomized mean? By what by what metric is it randomized? Because if I, I, don't, oh, I don't know, man. I I, just, I give up, man. I honestly give up. Just you just have to get what you can get when you can get it. Get what you can get when you can get it. Um, if it's not available in other places, and it is what it is. And no, if it's not available and you can't get it, then maybe it's a sign that it wasn't meant for you. I don't know, man. But <sighs> Jesus Christ, honestly, Jesus Christ, it's just a constant flipping nonsense that these guys put out man and make you feel like you're the one that's going dumb and crazy over these things it's like nah man it's not me bro it's you it's not me i tell you that right now it's never me it's never me my hair looks pretty mad isn't it my hair looks pretty 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 mad anyway i think i'm gonna end it there as per usual um as you can tell i ran out of steam <laughs> i'd have nothing else to talk about at this moment there's some other stuff that i want to mention but i'm gonna save that for tomorrow basically i'm gonna do a double header and put out another pod tomorrow so um thank you so much for tuning in it's been a pleasure to have your company as per usual um it's your first time checking out the show hi hope you hang around i'll be back again tomorrow for another show and i'll be back again on saturday for the i know tomorrow for the live stream so check that out
yeah, today's a live stream. If you're watching this today, there should be a DJ live stream happening. Um, Tech Test Mix episode number 61. So check that out if you'd like to hear me DJ. And then I'll be back doing what? What's the other thing I was going to do? Oh, yeah, I'll have another podcast out as well on the other Friday too. Or later on that week. Or later on that night. No, yeah, for Patreon. That's what I'm bloody on my brain's fried. I have another Patreon episode as well coming for you on saturday let's do saturday yeah, i'll do saturday it'll come out saturday but i'll have it ready already on friday so if you're on a patreon you should check that out as well it's coming at you very very soon but anyway man it's been a blast i think it's also for tuning into the show it's been a pleasure as per usual and i'll see you guys again very soon of course if you're listening to this via the audio platform it will just end with a nice lovely song chosen by me if you're watching it via youtube unfortunately it's just going to end and you won't have any songs or tunes so if you want to hear the tunes that are selected for the end of the podcast why not listen to the audio version of the show or listen to it listen to it come on join in join in but anyway peace take care bye